Today we're joined by Durga Maladi, who's the uh, Senior Vice President of Engineering at Qualcomm. Talk a bit about uh, what Qualcomm is doing in terms of 5G. So, Durga, thanks for joining us. Appreciate sure. it. My pleasure. So, I guess, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk at the show here about uh, the timing aspect of 5G. People want it yesterday, obviously, because that's how we are. But uh, I guess, what's uh, Qualcomm's view, I guess, in terms of when will 5G become, uh, become a reality? And I guess, uh, what's leading up to that eventual commercial launch as well? Right, I'll kind of answer that question in two different ways. Uh, the first one is related to the standards process. So 5G is going through the standardization process as we speak. Uh, it's called as, uh, uh, in the standards process, it's known as new radio, NR. So 5G NR uh, corresponds to the air interface part and the protocol stack, and then uh, the core network is called the next-gen core network. Both of these, uh, the standardization process has begun, and it's coming in what are known as releases in 3GPP. The expectation is that the standards process will complete uh, by the middle of 2018, and some aspects of that standards process will come in a little earlier, mm -hmm. what is known as the accelerated schedule for that. Uh, at least that's the goal, to get some of the basic services like the enhancements in mobile broadband uh, a little earlier, mm -hmm. especially when it is tethered to some other sort of an anchor, uh, perhaps a 4G anchor. So the standards process is going to complete, let's say, by the middle of 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, in parallel, uh, from Qualcomm's perspective and also with a lot of our partners, we're also trying to make sure that we test this in a spec-compliant manner, everything that's going into the NR process. Uh, testing it in pre-commercial trials, using prototypes and so on, so that we know exactly what we're getting out of the system. So it's going to be not exactly uh, a process where everything first gets done in the standards and then we start the commercialization process, but it's a work in progress in parallel, and we hit the ground running by the time we get to commercialization. What's the general view of how that progress has been, has been, right. has been made? <clears throat> I think that's a good question. So one of the things is that standards as a process, uh, in fact, if you kind of step back and think about how long it takes to do a new generation, uh, usually it takes you know, a lot of discussions, large number of entities coming in. And for 5G, we've always mentioned that as a transformational technology in the sense it's not just about mobile broadband. Mm -hmm. It's also bringing in a lots of other industries and taking requirements from them when it comes to mission critical services or IOE services. And for those of us who've done this in the past, we know how it works. It takes time, but it's also important to do that the right way. Because this is a, a, a technology that we expect to last over the next you know, one and a half decades or so. So it's not something that you want to do in a hurry, but at the same time, there's also a need to get things, some of the things done a little earlier. So from our standpoint, we are, you know, quite happy with the way the standards process is going. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly want to accelerate the, that a little bit more, and there's a large, of, uh, large number of our partners who feel exactly the same way, and we think it's coming along well. We can always do more, but we think it's coming along well. Got it, got it. And I guess, what's Qualcomm's role and how do you guys participate in, the, in this ongoing development? So from R&D standpoint, uh, we are heavily involved in the design, the standardization, the prototyping, the testbed activities, and working with our partners to, uh, to bring this to the table. So we have teams that actually not only do the design uh, back in our offices, but we actually send them, those people actually go out there. I used to be one of those uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. But you go out there and you articulate all the things that we are talking about in the standards process. So it's a very uh, cohesive team and it's a very good cohesive input into the process. That's design and standards. But then you always reach a point when you go beyond the analysis and just the PowerPoint slides uh, and you want to build it and test it. Mm -hmm. It's good to talk about low latency, but as you start building it, you realize that there are lots of other things one needs, one needs to worry about. And uh, so we're building prototypes. And these prototypes, something that we announced earlier this year, mm -hmm. uh, back in June, uh, what we called as the NR compliant prototypes, both for sub-6 and eventually for millimeter wave as well. We already have a working prototype on that. The idea is not only do we test our technology into it, but eventually we also take into account all the decisions coming in the standards process into the prototype. Mm -hmm. So imagine a point in time when this prototype is not just something that we do for our own internal testing, but it's available for interop testing with anyone else. That's a key part of this whole exercise. And now switching gears to the commercialization phase, we work very closely with our own chipset division. I mean, our colleagues actually, all the lessons learned from the standards or the design and the prototyping activities get fed into a commercialization as well. So it's kind of a very smooth way of uh, handoff really between our research part and uh, uh, commercialization. Well, how important is LTE to 5G? Because as you talked about earlier, I mean, LTE is, it's got a lot of runway, there's still lots of releases to go with LTE. Uh, I mean, how important is LTE to the, uh, I guess, to the support of, of 5G kind of down the road? That, so when it comes to, um, 
if you take a look at the uh, all the generational changes so far, every time we've changed a generation from 1G to 2G, 2G to 3G, and 3G to 4G, we've typically changed the waveform mm -hmm. and perhaps added a few more things, went all the way from analog to where we are today. Uh, as we are going from 4G to 5G, in fact, the basics are going to be the same in terms of the waveform, OFTM-based waveform for mobile broadband. For some of the other services, we are thinking of other waveforms over there, but OFTM-based, is, is it's going to remain the same. Mm -hmm. A lot of the lessons learned in 4G are being used by us as we design 5G from ground up. And uh, let me give you an example of that. One of the things is that uh, we, about three, four years back when we first started talking about how can we use unlicensed spectrum along with licensed spectrum, uh, if you, you know, there are two ways of looking at it. One, it's a pretty, pretty big thing the way we actually went about doing this in 4G space. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we have the opportunity to have a clean sheet of paper, and if you were to do this from start, how would we do it? And that's what we're trying to do. So 5G, for instance, talks about uh, the mid bands, the low bands, and the high bands, and licensed and unlicensed from day one. Mm -hmm. And perhaps one of the most important feature that we are adding is we've learned that we can't always anticipate all the new services. We can't actually anticipate what else is going to be important for us, so in that sense, we're making 5G as a system that's future compatible. It's future proof in the sense that you can always add in more services later without impacting the existing services. And we believe that's actually a very key part of it, of 5G. Uh, we've never done something of this sort before. Um, and in that sense, the lessons learned from 4G are directly applicable from our standpoint, and we are bringing that to the table in 5G. Interesting. So it's all about just managing that complexity at some point. That's uh, right. Level, that's and one level. of the other things I want to mention is that why is 4G important for 5G is that if you think of a multi-connected uh, or multi-connected uh, device, uh, today we don't talk of devices that are just uh, hanging on to one radio or the other, but it's the most efficient usage of all the resources that are available. So you might be getting some services from Wi-Fi, some from 4G, and some from 5G. And at any given point in time, it might be a combination of all three. Because from an end user standpoint, you could care less as to how you're getting served as long as you're getting served. And that's an important piece of, the, of this puzzle. Yeah, interesting, yeah. And how important is it for Qualcomm to kind of be a part of this process? Because again, you guys like, you know, again, we're, we're instrumental in 2G, 3G, 4G. Uh, as kind of 5G rolls out now, how important is it for the company itself to kind of be part of this and taking kind of a leadership role and really helping to drive I mean, all the partnerships you have, all the work you guys have been doing in the, in the background? How important is all that for the, for the company itself? It's, it's very important, but to be honest, we don't actually even think about it. It's in our <laughs> DNA, we just do it, and it turns out that we are, we are pioneering all these things, but we don't set about thinking, let's pioneer this, but we actually just do it, and it wasn't obvious that we should be using small cells in 4G. It wasn't obvious that we should be taking licensed and unlicensed together. Uh, nothing is obvious, broadcast technologies, uh, vehicular communications, nothing is obvious. But we, we started thinking about it and I said, what else can we do in this space? We have exactly the same approach in 5G as well. And I guess what makes kind of Qualcomm unique in this space? Because again, you guys do have a lot of history here, a lot, a lot of partnerships. What kind of makes Qualcomm, in your view at least, kind of stick out from Perhaps some other companies that are maybe doing stuff that's similar to you guys, but obviously you guys have a, definitely kind of a unique position there. What's, what's, what's unique about Qualcomm out there? From our standpoint, I think uh, the ability to work in a very complicated space uh, with regulators, with uh, our partners, both in the, uh, uh, the operator community and in the infrastructure community, uh, with the device vendors, and we've had this unique ability to work with a large number of entities, it's a complex ecosystem out there, and putting together technology which looks simple, it's quite complex, but we actually want to make it uh, and build it in such a way that it can be used in our daily lives. And in that sense, we believe that we have a pretty unique ability to pull it all together. And uh, because the ambitions that we have for 5G are not just about, you know, just the higher data rates. It's a lot more than just that. And if you're going to get going on that, working with cities, uh, we have a smart cities program that actually works mm -hmm. with uh, what can we do in the IOE space. Uh, these um, sorts of uh, interactions are very critical to making sure that 5G happens the right way. We feel, we feel that we are uniquely positioned in that space. Interesting, great. Well, hey, Durga, just appreciate your time. Thanks so much for the time today. Thank you. All right. All right.